this sometimes gets confusing, so I'm going to say it again as it relates to specific disorders. Cranial nerve 7 has actually has two nuclei, one controlling the upper part of the face and the other controlling the lower part of the face. The upper nuclei is innervated bilaterally from both sides of the brain, while the lower receives input from only the contralateral side. If you damage only the left motor cortex, that would be an upper motor neuron lesion, all of your upper face muscles should be working because the upper nuclei of cranial nerve 7 is bilaterally innervated, while the right or contralateral side of your face will be droopy. However, in a lower motor neuron lesion where cranial nerve 7 is knocked out at the level of the brainstem or below, the entire side of the face on the side that was damaged will be impaired. This is what happens in Bell's palsy. See the picture on the right? Both her eye, forehead, and lower corner of her mouth is affected on the left side due to lower motor neuron damage affecting cranial nerve 7 on the left side. This actually is clinically important to us because if you have someone with unilateral damage to vagus and the soft palate is drooping on one side, but when you ask the patient to say, ah, 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 and you see a little bit of movement on one side, you might think, oh, okay, vagus is not completely knocked out, but actually it is. The movement that you see is because the tensor, uh, the tensor vili palatini is still being innervated by cranial nerve 9, which has not been affected. If you do get in there and see a bifid uvula, be certain that you check for submucal clefting. A submucous cleft of the soft palate is due to a midline deficiency or lack of muscular tissue and incorrect repositioning of those muscles. A submucous cleft of the hard palate is actually a bony defect in the midline or center of that bony palate. This can sometimes be felt as a notch or a depression in the hard palate. If there is a bluish color in the velum, or if the velum appears like an inverted V during phonation, a submucous cleft should be suspected. This cranial nerve is motor only. It technically receives bilateral innervation, but the contralateral innervation is so predominant it's just easier to think that the left hemisphere controls the right half of the tongue and the right hemisphere controls the left half of the tongue. This means, for example, that a lesion affecting the cortical bulbar tract, the upper motor neurons, as it leaves the cortex to go down to the 12th cranial nerves in the brainstem will cause the tongue to deviate to the right on protrusion or away from the site of lesion. In fact, there is a, a landmark study that showed that in most healthy people, about 37% of healthy people didn't have a gag reflex. All of the subjects except for one, however, had intact pharyngeal sensation. The results of this study suggest that the muscles that control the gag reflex remain independent of those that control normal swallowing. Since this reflex is commonly not found in healthy people, I think its predictive value in determining the risk for swallowing disorders is severely limited. Here's another important factoid to be aware of. The motor control of voluntary facial and lip movements differs from the control of spontaneous expression. What that means is, for example, a patient with left lower facial paresis resulting from damage to the central nervous system may sometimes spontaneously smile symmetrically in response to listening to, say, one of my hilarious jokes or looking at a picture, for example, of their grandchild. When you ask them to smile, 
they show left lower facial weakness. You're going to see increased range of motion and range of movement during spontaneous movements than during voluntary movements. This is actually opposite though with patients with Parkinson's disease where they can imitate facial and lip gestures during an oral mech exam with relatively normal movements. But if you take a look at their spontaneous facial movements for smiling, their movements are very restricted. And that's called a, having like a masked facies or masked facial expression. At the end of your oral mech exam, is a summary of the cranial nerves and their primary functions for speech and swallowing. Also included in this um, course are sample reports. So it can help you um, with some of the language for writing up results of an oral mech cranial nerve examination. You'll see that I try to avoid um, I don't try to, I mean, I avoid saying cranial nerve 5 is normal, cranial nerve 7 is um, damaged, because we don't know that. We're not tested. We don't know that. But you can say, um, well, I'll give you examples, but you can say whether or not they passed or failed that portion of the examination.